so I appreciate that. All right, let me get my props up here a little bit. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 1 Kings uh, chapter number 8. 1 Kings chapter number 8. First Kings chapter number 8, I want to begin reading uh, in verse number 54. First Kings chapter 8 and verse number 54. Sounds like the pages have almost stopped turning, so you have found it. Today it's, the buttons have stopped clicking, so you have found it if you have... You're depending on a digital copy of the, the Bible. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 54, and it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he hath promised, there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us. Notice the wording in verse number 58, that he, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. And let these my words wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night that he remain the cause of his servant, that, excuse me, that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times as the matter shall require. That all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and, there, and that there is none else. Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes, to keep his commandments as at this day. The wording of verse number 58 tied in with verse number 61, gives us the premise for the message tonight. It does not say that we will incline our hearts, but that he may incline our hearts. The presence of God and the promises fulfilled from God, when God, when he prayed and said, God, don't leave us, do not forsake us. And that goes according to the promise of God. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Those things, in, by, by those things, God inclines our hearts to him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. Now, verse number 61, let your heart therefore be perfect, perfect with the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. The idea that I want to come, come at tonight or the direction I want to come at tonight is this idea of full-time Christians, full-time Christians. We, <clears throat> kind of building on last Wednesday and this morning's message, it's a, a, a line or a string of thought that has been on my heart for a few weeks or even longer, so a few months, about being more committed and more sold out for the Lord. Very often I talk to people about such things and their attitude is, well, I don't know that I have time to be more sold out to the Lord. Don't know that I have any more time to invest in the work of God. And, 
And we're missing the, the, the we're missing connections if we think that being a, being a full-time Christian means that we have to do something more in service, when in reality it's more about being than doing, although doing comes from or is a result of being. Does that make sense to you? And so it's not about, well, we just need to do something more. We need to, instead of reading our Bible through once a year, we need to read it through twice a year. And then when we do that, well, then we need to read it through three times a year, and it's just about doing more and doing more, and that's just not the case. I, I know people that read their Bible through slowly, but they read their Bible through. I know a friend of mine right now is reading the Bible through in 90 days, and and uh, so many chapters a day, and and that's there's 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 not a wrong way to read the Bible, <laughs> other than I guess there is wrong, one wrong way inconsistently. That would be a wrong way to read the Bible, Amen. I don't know that you ought to speed read the Bible, <laughs> but 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 as far as Bible reading programs or Bible reading plans, there are things that are beneficial to certain plans, but there's not a wrong way to read the Bible. And so it's not about full-time, being a full-time Christian, it's not about reading the Bible through faster. It's about being consistent with what we're doing. It's about not being part-time in our walk with God. We desire God to be our full-time Heavenly Father, amen? And my matter of fact, you see that in Solomon's words here. Let's go back to that. And he says in verse number, uh, verse number uh, 59, let these my words wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night. <clears throat> and that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times as the matter shall require that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord, he is God, and that there is none else. That last phrase of verse number 60 is one of my favorite thoughts from the latter chapters of the book of Isaiah. Sister Wark and I were talking about the book of Isaiah this morning. What a blessing it is. The book of Isaiah, some of the, the, the uh, thoughts of the latter chapters, the, the Bible says uh, in, in those latter chapters, the Bible says, I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. He says, and beside me there is none else. And, uh, and so this idea that there is none else, but did you, did you catch that Solomon in his prayer said, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that my words might be before the Lord all the time, 24 hours a day, day and night, and that he might maintain my cause at all times as, as the need requires. Did you, did you catch that? At the end of verse number 59, uh, and, and, and the cause of his people Israel at all times as the matter shall require. You know, sometimes there's things going on in my life that require the attention of God and, it's, and it can't wait until Sunday. It can't wait until prayer meeting. It's got to be now. And we want God to be our full-time father. We need to be full-time Christians. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his help. Father, I, I already feel that uh, I desire you to take absolute control of the sermon, of the message that is being presented tonight, Lord, that, uh, that you have a direction that you might take it that is not in my plan, but God, may you speak to our hearts and challenge us not to be casual. Lord, to stir up ourselves to take hold of you. And God, to be full time in our walk with you, resolute, day and night, and if we desire your cause, you to maintain our cause at all times as the need requires, God, may we maintain your cause 
at all times as is required. And may, may these things be found pleasing in your sight. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. What a tremendous thought here in 1 Kings as Solomon has prayed this dedicatory prayer. And, and now he's not just praying before the people. He's talking He's been talking to the Lord and he's prayed and lifted up his voice to God. And now he's, he's uh, making a public declaration to the people that what we need is to, to walk in all his ways and that his presence among us, his working among us, will incline our hearts to him day and night at all times. There are, there's much... Uh, today that I guess would pass for part-time Christianity. I want to talk about the word Christian in just a moment, but if we're not careful, we'll let, as I said this morning, we'll judge things by our experience. We'll judge the Bible by our experience. My wife and I were talking this afternoon for a little bit and and we had mentioned that how we tend to look at everything through, I mentioned this morning how we tend to look at everything through the United States of America or northern states. And, and, and Brother Caleb already restarted the battles between the north and the south this evening, but he's like, you know, we thought that the Civil War was over, but it's uh, evidently not. And, and I was surprised you didn't go into the northern tribes went away into bondage before the southern tribes and, and uh, there's a lot of support for your thesis but you uh, didn't go there but uh, I guess I just did. Uh, it's on you now. <laughs> it's on, I'm just going to say talk to Brother Caleb about that and because um, I'm not really a southerner I'm a Texan and that's different. If, you, if you've been in Texas you know that's different. We don't consider ourselves Southerners with the Southern states. We are our own country. Um, and so, but <laughs> there's truth to that. I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh, but this, this idea that, that we look at everything through this prism of America, and she was mentioning some of the missions trips that she's been on and, and uh, how that, you know, Compared to churches here, you know, they're not increased with goods and have need of nothing. They're very oftentimes very needy. And, it is, and it's so true that we tend to look at everything through our lens instead of the lens of the word of God or see things the way God sees them. You talk about part-time Christianity. I was, I heard a little bit of a, of a, uh, Sermon, I guess you would call it, uh, by a Lutheran minister that was talking about there's, you know, we think that hatred and uh, hatred is, you know, in our past, but there's, there's all kinds of evidence of hatred today, the lack of the love of God, and, but his evidence was the way we treat the planet. And, uh, you know, ask anybody that is a minority, and uh, ask anybody that is uh, uh, with, you know, that is uh, in, uh, from a sodomite background. I know they'll tell you hatred is still alive. And that's, their, that's their evidence that, uh, that we're not following the word of God. And through all of that, there wasn't one mention of abortion or anything that the Bible uh, speaks against. But, but we're, we're looking at it, if they're looking at it from this skewed perspective of this is what constitutes hatred. I read a part of it as when I'm thinking about a, a sermon idea, God speaks to my heart about a topic. I Sometimes if I think about it long enough, that translates in this is going to end up being a message at some point. And, uh, and it was uh, told one of the men that, that very often I look up messages on the topic and read them. And I read part of a message <laughs> not that long ago, uh, that uh, it was uh, on the subject of part-time Christians. And, but the whole thing about 
their thing about part-time Christians was that if you are, if you have or have been or are now a, a Donald Trump supporter, you're not really a, a committed biblical Christian. It's all judged in politics. And, uh, and how could you possibly, you know, be a, a Christian, a real Christian, is the way they put it. How could you possibly be a real Christian and, uh, and go along with those uh, political views? But again, that's somebody viewing things through a very skewed prism. And we say, well, we would never do that, but if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing on the other side. When it comes right down to it, we need to be judged or judge ourselves according to God's word about whether or not we are going to be a Christian on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or what they call 24-7. My dad used to always invert that and say 724, and we never knew what that was. It was the time or if it was, uh, you know, but he'd always say 724. And so we need to be careful about what we classify as part-time Christianity. Here in 1 Kings, it's talking about inclining our hearts to the Lord in all his ways. You know, when you think about it, it's a long time from Sunday morning to Sunday morning, amen? Well, there's a lot of hours between that. There's a lot of things that, that demand uh, the help of God from between Sunday and Sunday. There's a lot of things that need prayer between Sundays. There's a lot of, there's a lot of life that is lived between Sundays. And if we are going to be at all what God wants us to be, we're going to have to be more than just part-time Christians. Someone said, that our job needs to be to make more Christians and to make Christians more. It's an interesting way to phrase it, is it not? To make more Christians and to make Christians more. Part-time Christians will never really accomplish what God has set out for them to do. We need to understand that uh, part-time Christianity is, is only going to be, okay, somebody that's part-time, if somebody puts on the uniform, shows up and fills a time slot, but they're not really invested in the business or in the company. You might have, and I know uh, there are folks here that you've got your, you know, what this is your occupation or this is your focus. And then you've got something that maybe you call it your side hustle. It's a little part time this or that. And it's not something you do all the time. It's not something you're totally invested in. It's just something that you add to. And that's the way a lot of times that people view their Christian life. But there are three, three times that the word Christian appears in our Bible that help us to understand what God means when he says a Christian. Go with me to Acts chapter number 11. And I know you've seen this be these before, but maybe it's been some time and so it would not hurt us to refresh our memories briefly. In Acts chapter number 11... Uh, the Bible says in verse number 26, And when he had found him, speaking of Saul, who would become Paul, when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Notice this. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. There was something about them that they didn't put the name Christian up on the building, but they were called Christians. Because the name Christian means a follower 
of Christ. Some say, well, the word Christian means Christ-like. There's nothing wrong with that definition either. To be like the Lord Jesus Christ, to be identified as a follower of Christ. Uh, here, if you uh, want to take this as just uh, a sidebar on, on Acts chapter number 11, what caused them, what caused them to be called Christians first at Antioch? It's the place where you really could call it, you know, uh, the first, the first uh, Christian church at Antioch, but Christians, the, what happened there? Well, number one, they were faithful in God's house. God's word was taught and people were saved. And these three things combined to give them the testimony, to have it witnessed of them that this is the first place they were called Christians. I believe when the Bible stops to point out this is the very first time they were called Christians. It, it, it mean, it's meant for us to look and see what was it about them that caused them to be called Christians. And then the second place, not only here in Acts 11, but Acts 26. In Acts chapter 26. And then... In verse number 28, the Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. The Apostle Paul was giving a testimony of his faith in Christ. He was sharing that with Agrippa. He was attempting to persuade Agrippa to accept Jesus Christ to the point that Agrippa's words reveal that Paul almost persuaded him. You know, there are those who say, well, we, sh we shouldn't try to persuade anybody to accept Jesus. Well, Paul was doing that. I figure if it was okay with God that Paul did it, it's probably okay with God that we do it to do our best to persuade men to be a Christian. And by the way, you say, well, he almost persuaded him. Yeah, but if you look at what Paul says, he says, I would that you were altogether persuaded. Mm -hmm. Paul feels that he falls short in this area. So they're called Christians first at Antioch. People of Antioch were probably making fun of them when they called them Christians. It was probably meant to be a derogatory term, but it was their action, it was the way they lived that was different from the world and significantly different enough. I, can, I, can I propose something about that Antioch church? Religion did not get invented with Jesus Christ. There was already religion. It was paganism and Judaism. That's basically the two categories that existed. But you know what was common? It was common for people to go to a religious meeting of some sort, whether it be a sacrifice in a pagan temple, whether it be uh, a service at a synagogue, whatever it might be, it was common for people to go to a place for a religious service or ceremony. You know what was also common? Is that between the times that they would go, they would very often just live however they wanted to live. You'd go and appease the gods, and then you'd live like you'd want to live. You'd go to synagogue, and then you'd live like you'd want to live. You know what was unusual? To go to a place where we call it God's house, to go to a church service and come away from that living differently day in and day out to commit ourselves, uh, to commit our heart to all the ways of God all the time, 24-7, like we want God to take up our cause at all times. If we want God and we desire, we desire God to be our full-time Heavenly Father, we also should be his full-time child. 
And so we see the connection here. Then go with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter four. And look with me at verse number 15 and 16, verses 15 and 16. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. First, first Peter four sixteen. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The idea of suffering as a Christian means that you are suffering because you are a Christian. Would you agree with that? Say amen. That, that there's something about your life that is more than Sunday morning. It's more than part time. It's more than casual to suffer as a Christian. It is sobering, convicting, and encouraging, all wrapped up in one big ball. On Sunday mornings when we hear the martyrs' testimonies about their willingness to live for God, not just part-time, but all the time. Not just when it was easy, <clears throat> Not just when there was no persecution, but even when there was persecution. What does it mean then? Why, why do we need to be full-time Christians? Well, part-time Christians will never accomplish what needs to be accomplished in the age in which we live. We, we are still, if, if we believe that we are in a long uh, line of scriptural New Testament churches, and I believe that we are, I believe that we try to hold as best we can to the word of God as best as our, not just as best as to our ability, but as best as our understanding to the word of God. And that puts us in a long line of Bible-believing churches, churches like the church that Jesus Christ himself started. And if we are going to be, if we believe that we are, that we, uh, uh, that's where we land, then it's still true for us today that we have the commission to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Meeting together on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, worships him and facilitates the commission. Think about it with me. It honors God, worships him, but also facilitates the commission. Because it is where we are taught, trained, and sent so, oh yeah, preacher, I know we send missionaries to foreign countries. No, no, no. You need to look in the mirror and realize that the idea is you are sent. You might not be sent to a country where you can't speak the language, but you are sent to a country where you do speak the language. You live there. You grew up there. The, most of you, your, your, your dialect is native to where you live. You say things like flag and beg. You speak the language. You know, just because, how many of you, you're, you are Scandinavian, you have Scandinavian background? Amen? Okay, you don't want to admit it, do you? Come on, it's some, you know, Norwegians, Finland, you know, you have some Scandinavian background, okay. How many of you that just raised your hand do not like Ludafisk? Well, you're not really Scandinavian. No, you're not really. You can't be because don't they like those, that, that stuff? I, yeah, some. It's just like our children are all equally German. And I know that because they have the same father and same mother. Isn't that nice when it works that way? That all your children have the same father and the same mother. It's kind of the way God planned it. This is, it's convenient. And it makes it easier to illustrate. And so they all have the same father and the same mother. So whatever part German they are, they, you know, it's equal between them. Are you agree? Say, you understand? Say amen. Okay. They do not all equally like sauerkraut. They should. 
Why? Could be because they're German. I can't tell you how many times I ask them, hey, do you like sauerkraut? Well, I'm German. Well, there are plenty of Germans who do not like, how many of you have German in your background? Some, okay, some part. How many of you just raise your hands, do not like sauerkraut? The smell of it, the look of it, the taste of it, any part of it, amen. And, I, and I'm just saying, look, if, you're, if you don't like yourself a good schnitzel <laughs> with some sauerkraut, you can't really be German. <laughs> but that's the way we think about, it's just not true that everybody that is of that nationality likes the same things or does the same things. Not everybody that calls himself a Christian is a full-time Christian. Not everybody that calls himself a Christian believes the same things or, or thinks the same way or understands the Bible the same way. You say, well, how's all that going to get sorted out? I'll tell you how. God's going to sort it out. What's for me to do is to be as consistent with this book as I can be. And I can tell you this. God needs full-time Christians. Part-time workers do not usually do not usually uh, know what's going on half the time. It's just, here's your little thing. You know, you stand here at this kiosk or whatever, and just every time the light turns red, you push the button. You don't even know what the company's making probably. You're just a button pusher, amen? Just button pusher. That's part-time workers. And a lot of times, that's part-time Christians. They don't really understand the big picture. I just know that, on Sunday morning, the pastor is going to expect me to be sitting in a certain seat or a certain spot. And that's my part. That's my button to push. And once I've pushed it, I don't really know what else is going on, but I'm just, I just am a button pusher. Part-time Christians, part-time employees, uh, you can't necessarily depend on them all the time either, just the same way as part-time Christians. You know, something else about part-time workers is they're missing out on a lot of benefits, aren't they? A lot of businesses try to keep workers below a certain level so they don't have to pay them benefits. I understand the business model of that. But can I make a comparison or a, uh, an il use an illustration? That is that a lot of times part-time Christians are missing out on a lot of spiritual benefits. We need to be full-time Christians. We need to say, we need to ask God to incline our hearts to him that we might obey in all his ways and like we want him to make our matters his concern at all times as, need, as the need arises we ought to also make his concern, his business, our concern at all times. Our motives matter. I came across, I came across a term recently. I'm guessing at how to pronounce it. Anybody, you, you, you're familiar with the term rhino. The rhino not, not the animal, not not in Africa, right? Okay, rhinos. That, that stands for what? Republican in name only. I recently came across, I guess you would say it, um, kinos. Christians in name only. How convicting should that be? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a Christian in name only. I don't want to go farther down that. I may preach that next Sunday. I don't know. But Christians in name only. I do know this. Christian, I do know that God needs and deserves more from me. He needs and deserves more faithfulness on my part. He needs and deserves more dedication. 
He needs and deserves more holiness, more godliness. He needs and deserves more of my love and attention. He needs and deserves more of my focus, the focus of my life. He needs and deserves more of uh, a larger portion allotted to walking with him. I want to be a full-time Christian. I want to be 24-7. I want to be involved in his work at all times. I want to be, as the word of God said, that where, where Solomon said that, that God's ways would, uh, that God would incline himself to their needs at all times as needed that we would incline ourselves to his needs at all times, that, that we would decide that we're not going to just go from Sunday to Sunday. Full-time Christians pray regularly. Full-time Christians read and study and meditate on God's word. Full-time Christians try to be as as clean away from God's house as they are in God's house. Full-time Christians try to be, uh, try to not slide by in their personal life, whatever role they might have, whether it's husband, father, parent, child. And that we, listen, we need to maintain God's cause at all times. Maintain God's cause at all times. I've challenged you, it's just become a thing with me over the past probably five or six months, to challenge you that I believe every Christian at all times ought to have some great truth that captivates your thoughts. You think about it on a regular basis. You meditate on it. When you read the Bible, you see verses and all the time. It seems like it's applying itself to that. And that great truth might be with you for months, weeks, maybe years. I don't know. It seems like you know, it stays, one stays with me till God gives me a different one. Right now, it's this, <clears throat> this idea of, of stirring up myself to take hold of God and and uh, to be captivated with, with some great truth or some principle from the Bible. And, and if we don't have that, it's very easy to go from Sunday to Sunday and just go about our business as part-time Christians. I want to be a full-time Christian. I want to maintain. I'm using the words of Solomon concerning God. They want him to maintain uh, their cause at all times. And I'm turning it around and saying, if we want God to maintain our cause at all times, it seems like we should maintain his cause at all times. Father, I pray that you would help us. Lord, we must, we must be able to identify ourselves as less than sold out or part-time in our in our service or part-time in our attention. That can only happen with the help of the Holy Spirit. Then we must be willing to admit that, yes, you deserve more from us. More holiness, more, more godliness, more commitment, more of our times and more of our time and more of our treasure, and more, just more of us. Not that we might just do more things, but that you might have more of us. And God, I pray that we'll then, with the wisdom and understanding that you give us, that we'll act upon that and say, God, make me to be that kind of a Christian, the kind of Christian that is sold out, the kind of Christian that someone might say, that person is a real Christian.
To be called Christians first at Antioch is taken. We can't do that, but we can be the first in our neighborhood, the first in a family, the first in a, in a, 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 on the job that others would look at and say there, they are a real or a genuine Christian. And that we might even be willing to suffer as a Christian, meaning that we would do things that would draw the attention of the enemy. And Father, I pray that we would be busy about persuading others to be a Christian by our life and by our testimony. And God, I know for me personally, you deserve more. It's my heart at this point, right now, standing here tonight, to give what you deserve. Lord, I pray that it, you help it stay with me after I leave the pulpit, and after the sermon is over, and after the fellowship is done, but to walk with you and to be mindful of you at all times. God, I pray that it would be so and that Christ might be magnified in it. In Jesus' name we pray.